for today, uh, we don't have as many topics as recently on the agenda. However, we uh, the topics that were proposed on the community channel are a conversation about uh, uh, Antria proxy uh, default support in Antria 010. Sorry, I expressed myself in a terrible way. I meant to say make Antria proxy the default option in uh, Antria 010. And uh, then the other topic that has been proposed is uh, backward compatibility for CMP AMP APIs. So um, recording has started. So perhaps we can start the conversation on uh, Antria proxy and uh, whether it should be made default. Uh, I believe that uh, Wei Chang performed some experiments uh, related to uh, the Antria proxy resource usage. So perhaps Wei Chang, you can start sharing uh, your experience. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I didn't get the schedule for today's meeting, but uh, I used to test for the uh, memory consumption of the Antria Proxy uh, with Antria Proxy enabled uh, and uh, with, uh, with 2,000 services. Uh, the, Antria, uh, the Antria agent cost about uh, 50 megabytes. So I think the, the memory consumption is reasonable. Okay. And uh, one question is, uh, is the increase linear with the number of services or did you observe uh, a different relationship? It's, uh, it's approximately linearly. And uh, as average uh, service uh, memory consumption uh, increase very little, uh, uh, about uh, one or two kilobytes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when you say the memory cost is 50 megabytes for 2000 services, is that total or is that in, uh, as compared to QProxy? Uh, compared to QProxy, yeah, the increase part of the uh, Antrim agent, yeah. Okay, so it's really, you're really comparing uh, entry a proxy disabled and entry a proxy enabled, and you observe that the entry, <laughs> entry agent is using an extra 50 megabytes when you enable yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this extra memory consumption, anyway, is uh, static, right? It's uh, so it does not increase over time. Unless, if you keep the number of services constant, uh, memory usage doesn't increase over time or doesn't depend on the traffic being handled by the proxy. It remains constant. Is that correct? Yeah, it's constant. OK. Uh, and how does that compare to the uh, memory consumption of the agent without entry a proxy? Is that like? Uh, uh, is that like a big increase or is that? Um, um, both both, uh, both entry agent uh, ways always not the uh, entry proxy enabled uh, the memory is, is constant. Okay. Uh, I think another question was like uh, you you told us that it's uh, like uh, 50 megabytes more, but in uh, percentage is like 10%, uh, 20% more of the cube proxy, or did you do? Uh, did you calculate this? Uh, I meant compared to the agent when you don't have entry proxy enabled, like easy. I, and I, I understand that it depends on the size of the cluster and probably on other things, but is like in your benchmarks, was the agent using like 200 megabytes and then you enabled Q -pro you enabled an entry a proxy and it was like 250 megabytes or is that uh, very different from that? <laughs> well, I guess my point is 50 megabytes, the number you gave is like a, an absolute increase in memory usage. Um, but uh, relatively, is it like a big increase or is that like a 20% increase? Oh, the, the percentage. Um, 
I run this uh, this test in my uh, vacuum test band uh, without any uh, other resources like uh, policies or whatever. So um, the fresh uh, entry agent costs about uh, five five megabytes. I uh, I remember. Okay. So okay, the increase part is uh, totally the uh, proxy cache. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this update. Is there, uh, considering this information, is, uh, is there any feedback uh, regarding whether it is okay to enable uh, entry proxy by default in 0 010? Or perhaps you think uh, you, we may need to collect more information before making a decision? For now, I think uh, we are uh, we, we need the uh, Android proxy document, which I'm working on. And uh, any other things, I guess, uh, folks will have some uh, their opinions. I, I personally feel probably we need more scale tests, um, probably the dev tests are not enough. And I know the WML QE team are also doing some scale tests. Probably we, we can wait for the test results. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can enable this by default at some point because, I mean, right now we, that's the only thing we support for uh, non NCAP uh, uh, traffic modes, right? So it's a bit weird that we, this is the only thing we support for non NCAP traffic modes, but for NCAP, it's still like uh, something you have to enable. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. Okay, so the feedback is to uh, wait for uh, let's say more uh, precise, let's say more uh, accurate measurements at scale to get a better understanding uh, of uh, performance uh, and memory footprint at scale. Uh, but uh, our goal is uh, still to enable it uh, for the reasons that. Uh, have been listed by Antonin. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to bring up about the entry proxy? Okay, uh, which means uh, we can probably move uh, to the next topic about uh, uh, backward compatibility of CMP AMP APIs, and uh, I think that uh, at least according to the Slack channel, Abhishek has a, a couple of proposals to discuss. So, Abhishek, can you can you go ahead, please? Yeah, thanks, so much. Um So, I, as you guys, as everyone knows, that uh, in the previous release, we released uh, tiers in the form of static uh, form, like the static tiers, uh, which essentially mean that, you know, there are no resources created for them. Uh, it's uh, it's just a string as part of the enum in the cluster network policy and entry network policy uh, spec. Uh, and at the time, we also uh, made it clear in the documents that uh, we will uh, remove this and uh, supersede this uh, stat these static tiers uh, by tier CRDs uh, so that users have a flexibility of creating uh, as many tiers as they want, uh, you know, instead of those five static tiers that we've uh, introduced. And, uh, and, all you've, uh, and you all know that this is a alpha uh, release, uh, which is uh, behind a feature gate uh, uh, and the default is false. So, as as uh, as we move towards the tier CRDs, uh, um, you know the the there was a question that was raised uh, last week um, about uh, how do we manage the, the upgrade, uh, especially uh, that uh, the five static tiers. Uh, do we consider that entry at initialization? 
creates five uh, tier CRDs corresponding to those static tiers uh, on on in it, on in it, or or do we you know considering this is an alpha feature, maybe we do not carry forward that uh, you know uh, logic in Andrea, keep it clean uh, and uh, and then you know just starts start new with with the tier CRDs. Uh, so essentially, there are you know two proposals. One is uh, that uh, uh, considering this is a feature gated, uh, uh, sorry, this is gated behind a feature, feature gate, uh, uh, and it's an alpha feature. We we decide not to create these uh, tiers uh, by default. Uh, we only create the uh, the the default tier, which is the application tier. For all the policies which do not have a tier in their uh, spec, or the other one is that we do manage this uh, upgrade uh, by at the at startup we create one tier corresponding to each of those five static tiers, so five CRDs uh, or five CR custom resources on startup. Uh, now the logic essentially is uh, you know not very different from creating one default tier versus five, five uh, tiers. Uh, it is just that, do we want to handle uh, this upgrade and should we also um, uh, carry this code and how long shall, shall we carry this? And then you're kind of forcing users to uh, users the five tiers, which they may or may not be using. So that's that's the question to the, to the team uh, or the community. Uh, so anyone has any opinions on that? I know Cody has one. Uh, have I made the the problem clear? And uh, you know, in general, my opinion is that uh, uh, for any you know GA release or you know, any release which is uh, widely used or feature which is widely used, we should uh, make sure that uh, the upgrades are seamless and without any uh, incompatibility changes uh, introduced. Uh, but considering this, you know, it's just one release, and uh, uh, it was a, you know, it was alpha feature plus uh, no, unless we have like users who are actively using the tiers, uh, static tiers, uh, maybe then we do consider that. Uh, but if, if that's not the case, then maybe perhaps we can, you know, start clean with the tier CRDs. So, any opinion? Yeah, Hello, Abhishek. I have a thought. Uh, do we consider that uh, that uh, we continue keeping this static uh, tier uh, constants as uh, as hard coded uh, tiers and uh, not not managed by users? I know there is a similar case for Kubernetes priority class that you can use some API to define user defined. Uh, priority class, but uh, you can also specify two special priority class. One is a system node critical, and another is a system cluster critical, and they are mapped to two to priority uh, con consistent. So I wonder if we could do the same. And uh, uh, I, I remember that in the beginning, we don't want a user to delete some um, tiles, right? So I think this could solve that problem too. Uh, yes. So uh, so we are already we are we are going to be creating one uh, tier at startup, uh, which is the default tier uh, for let's say the application tier, and we will not allow users to delete that. The validation hook will ensure that uh, any system created. Uh, tiers, uh, uh, any updates or any deletes to them will be, you know, controlled by that validation hook and it will be rejected. So we definitely will do that for one tier. Uh, the one of the proposals that I had was that you know if we want to continue with these static tiers, you know, and seamlessly uh, add them into as CRDs, then maybe we uh, instead of creating one system tier we create these five system tiers corresponding to each of those static tiers. And then we kind of uh, add the logic in the validation webhook uh, to ensure that users do not delete uh, them. Uh, 
uh, that can be done and you know doing it for one tier versus five tiers is uh, is 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 not is is the same effort so it's not in terms of effort it's not any any different uh, so i just want to uh, know whether do we want to create five tiers uh, or do we want to handle five system tiers or lesser number of them or one is enough uh, i i mean to not creating cd for this uh, five tiers but just uh, hard code them in in, in code like uh, the private class the name system not critical that, so so if i if i do a get on these uh, you know a, as a user if i want to see what are existing tiers then if these are hard coded then uh, i don't as a user i do not know about them is, is that is that correct or for your yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that that will be that that need to be some well known uh, tiers that uh, we need to document that if you just want to use this uh, tiers you could just uh, reference them in your policies mm -hmm. if you want more you can define your own that 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 divides the tiers into two category user defined and the system defined the challenge is going to be the overlapping priorities. How do you set a priority on a static tier if you also have user-definable tiers that you may want to fall in between those static tiers? Yes. Uh, I think, do, do we still have the uh, constraint on the 10 overall tiers that we're trying to, we're trying to cons constrain that? Uh, so, you know, I think from Cody's past experiences, he mentioned that, you know, uh, the the general usage of tiers uh, is about five to seven and at max maybe around 10. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, no, that, I don't. That's right. Yeah. Uh, on the priorities, we are, you know, trying to keep maybe, you know, up to 255 priorities, uh, but maybe we start small. We start with ten, and then increase uh, the number of tiers as you know more tiers are expected by users or requested by uh, users. Uh, but coming back to Cody's uh, point, I think uh, you know having the the tiers in the CRD format uh, gives you you know if if you do a get tiers, you you see all of them and you see all of the priorities that have been previously allocated. Uh, instead of going through the documents and going through, you know, what are the allocated prior or what are the reserved priorities and which priorities I can use. Uh, so that is one advantage that I see about, you know, having them as uh, tiers, also oh, having them as custom resources uh, instead of uh, hard coded principle. Another option is we can always create those tiers and our user can decide to delete them if they wanted to. Sorry, Cody, uh, can you repeat that? I wasn't clear to me. I said another option is uh, we could always create the five static tiers using, you know, as a, as a, as a default mechanism using the CRDs. But a user could decide to delete a tier if it needed. So out of the box, all, you would always start with the five tiers. Um, Cody, I think your voice is breaking. If I, if I heard, I'm not sure what's happening here. Maybe my internet's I, messed up. If I heard you correctly, I think you you're saying that we allow. Oh, sorry, we manage uh, or we create these uh, five tiers, but allow users to delete them instead of you know not uh, instead of making them read only. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they could delete them. I, I guess in theory they could also change the value mapping for those tiers. Exactly. Okay. That would also give flexibility for priority or something like that. And uh, yeah, and I guess if we look at uh, Chan's analogy, right, with the priority class, uh, even for the system cluster critical and system node critical, it seems that they do uh, create API resources for those, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know if the user can delete them, but they do create those uh, those API resources, just like we would create CRDs for those uh, static tiers. Uh, 
I, I guess I, I wouldn't see the rational of creating like a single one versus creating all five of them. Uh, I don't know why you were uh, considering the, the single one solution in the first place. The single one is, uh, you know, mainly for uh, the default consumption, uh, wherein like if you had previous cluster network policies, uh, wherein, you know, before the existence of tiers, uh, so they, they don't have any reference to tiers. So they, they kind of fall into a single bracket or a single tier. And, uh, you know, you do want to show that there, there exists one tier at least, and your, all, all your existing policies have been, you know, uh, classified as part of that tier, and uh, they're all at the bottom of the of the uh, ordering hierarchy. That, that's the only reason why I would uh, instantiate one of one one tier. Yeah, another special thing about that tier is that for any of the CMP or AMP that doesn't specify a tier in the in the spec YAML, it will go to the default tier. Yeah, I see. I see. And you say there was still a limit on the number of tiers, and is it pretty small or is it pretty large? So at the moment, uh, it's it's part of the validation schema. Uh, we can always update that. Uh, the the upper we you know, you know as as we map tiers to you know OVS tables, uh, there are only x number of tables, uh, which is a small number. Uh, I think two fifty to fifty five something uh, available. Um, so we, we we don't expect the tiers to be used, you know, that many uh, tiers to be created. Uh, it would be a small number. Uh, so so, so if, we, if we keep the five static tiers by default, uh, sorry, if we auto automatically create those five tiers by default, does that mean that we force the pipeline to be five tables longer? Um, uh, unless the user deletes the CRDs, and we saw there were like some uh, performance issues with that. Is, uh, is that no, a... no. I think uh, we, as of now, the priority designer can handle more than a tier in the table. So we're we're basically thinking of you know for the ingress in the in the default t uh, in one of the CMP tables we handle the default tiers, and all the other rules in all the other tiers can go into a single table. And uh, we already have a PR for that. So that shouldn't okay. be an issue. Yeah. yeah, the reason why we have the a single table for the default tier is because we expect most people not to be using them. So they, most of the policies do end up in that one tier. Okay, well, I kind of feel like, yeah, maybe creating those five tiers is maybe both convenient and uh, maybe the right thing to do. Uh, and that's my personal opinion. And uh, I don't know if you want to say, okay, you can delete all five tiers or you can just delete those four tiers and you cannot delete the default tier. Um, and going back to Chan's analogy, once more, I just checked and you cannot delete like those two priorities, system cluster critical and system node critical so that you can visualize them. But I guess, I don't know if there is like a, an admission controller or something, but you cannot delete them. When you try, you get a, an error. So I don't know if we want to do the same thing for the default tier. That's another, another advantage of going with, with the five tiers out of the box uh, is I think as patterns evolve in the community on uh, common network patterns for, for setups very much in the same way like Helm charts would write for deployments, uh, common security patterns could follow those tiers. Um, hopefully, you know, hopefully they would be compatible across more more systems if, if we if, if all systems started with the same set of default tiers. And that's also tricky, right? That means we may have to adapt our <laughs> static tiers. Maybe, maybe. Um, just hoping that we may have some convention or standard there. Okay, so uh, looks like check. I'm not able to update or delete the uh, default uh, priority class of yeah i checked as well yeah I, I get an error when i try to delete them but i can i can visualize them so i guess it's like in our case that would be the same as creating those crds and for, i guess we should let the use, user delete them except maybe for the for the default mm -hmm. one yeah correct I, th I think that's fair enough just want to make sure that uh, you know everyone's on board with uh, 
with this approach or you know, one or the other approach. So seems like uh, most people on the call uh, prefer to have uh, one-to-one -one mapping to the static tier to the TCRDs. And then perhaps we can uh, make sure that only the default tier is something that is read only. The other tiers can be deleted by users. Yeah, and I think it's kind of like mapping to what Cody said. I think it's it's good from like a documentation and a user experience point of view because we can we can describe security models built for those like five tiers and kind of like assume there's going to be they're going to be there in like a standard installation of Entria. Right. Okay, I think that answers my question, um, which is good. I guess so then we can also claim that we are not going to be backwards incompatible. So, well, that, that assumes that it's not much more work for you. But I assume since you are preparing to create the default tier anyway, creating those five tiers and yeah. just making sure that the default one cannot be deleted is not too much of an issue. Yeah. yeah so I, yeah, the, the, that is already part of the PR. Uh, it's just now adding more more uh, tiers to be created but i'll just make sure that they are not read only uh, so it should not be too much work so actually uh, even so before it's changed do we already have a default here or default tier yeah. is uh, uh, so the default tier is i was going to map the application tier to the default tier uh, which would be the lowest uh, priority tier so um then the name is a fixed or you mean the name can be changed the name can be uh, changed. Uh, we we will handle it in, internally. But currently, uh, I mean, with the current static tiers release, uh, the application tier is the name that is already part of it. So, um, we, so we, you know, if if we have a mapping to the tier CRD, then I was thinking of using the same names, uh, but. But if we have a different name, then we we explicitly call that out that the static tier name was uh, renamed to you know X Y Z as a tier CRD. So yeah. uh, sure, let me let me try to understand this. So basically, I mean after upgrade, um, we will have uh, four, sorry, five pre-created tiers, and the uh, current tier will be the default tier. For later, you can remove other tiers, and you can rename the current tier. Uh, renaming would not, I mean, uh, no, no, you cannot rename the CRDs. It's, 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 it's like any other resource, like it, it, it's, it acts as a key, right? So, um, the we, place they were, we so, will always have is application here, right? Yeah. So I was thinking maybe at, as part of the, this, you know, upgrade process, we, we decide that, you know, maybe application tier is not the right name for the default tier to be used and we want to rename it to something else. Then we create a one uh, the tier corresponding to application tier, and we we name it. Uh, we don't name it uh, application. We name it something else, and we call that out in the documents. That, but but then once yeah. uh, that name is chosen, we keep keep that name. Is it's there is there an issue with naming it default tier? No, no such. Uh, a technical issue as such. Jinjin, did you have a particular uh, name in mind? No. <laughs> Naming the the hard <laughs> problem. <laughs> I, I was thinking if it's default here, maybe you you can just call it default. I don't know, but. Uh, I think the the thing that since you have other tiers, I forgot the names. I'm not sure they are. I mean, uh, this this other names match uh, default <laughs> tier name or not? I don't. Know. Maybe it's not an uh, important thing. Yeah, I mean, no. It's, I guess it's you know it's important because it's user facing. So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, but that we can we can decide that on the PR. Uh, so. Okay. Um, I also have a, another question going off uh, Cody's point. Um, I think uh, one of the initial you know, concerns Cody had was sort of like if we create all those five static tiers and when user wanted to create custom tiers, um, they, they need to be able to sort of like insert into two or 
so, uh, originally created tiers in terms of priority. So is that, uh, does that mean that we probably want to create all these five uh, initial tiers with um, priorities that's, you know, spaced out, for example, 10, 20, 30 or something. So it is always possible for user to, you know, using get CRD to query the, the actual priorities of those tiers and be able to always insert a new tier um, in between those. Yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, if, if if that was the plan, I my plan, uh, my proposal would be to space them out, uh, you know, okay. from zero to two fifty, some, you know, between between those digits. You know. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Uh, was it going to be like a float, like for priority, or was it going to be no, a, an integer? This okay. would be, uh, uh, and I mean, uh, integer. I mean, the priority range would be zero to two fifty five. And we will reserve uh, maybe some latter half, uh, not half, but latter, you know, last few uh, priorities for future use and maybe first few for future use. So that, you know, if at all we have some some extension that we do in the future, we, we have some priorities at both ends reserved. Sounds good. So I was still thinking uh, the reason we want to pre-created the five tiers just because we want to keep the compatibility across versions, right? Um, but if we rename the the tier, then uh, it still breaks the compatibility, no? We can, you know, internally handle the name, you know, let, let's say application is now default. So any, any cluster network policy, which was mapped to an application tier, uh, we we convert them into a default tier. I mean, we can handle some of those uh, changes. I understood, but from user perspective, it's still a change, right? Yes, and uh, there is a description field uh, for the tier CRDs that I've added. Maybe we can add some additional information on that. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's you know. As long as we document that, maybe the user doesn't have to take any action on that. You know, it, it's uh, from from user's perspective, they don't really need to take an action except that know that there is a change of names. Uh, in the other case where we do not create these, then then the user needs to uh, you know either uh, create new CRDs and map the the policies into those new CRDs. That would be a new action on user's part. Okay. But uh, based on the conversation we've had, I wouldn't say that backward compatibility is the only reason here. I mean, that's a plus, but I think that was the, the point that uh, Cody brought about like kind of like uniformizing the security model. And uh, I think it's just more convenient also for users to have those pre-existing tiers. That is true. Um... But if we go that model, then it sounds a little strange. We keep the default tier special from others. It means you, I don't know. Yeah, the, the, re the reason it's called name. the reason it's called default tier is we have to have a tier, right, for any policy to land in at least at least one. And so we could we could document that that's not capable of being deleted. I think that that's a, I think that's a reasonable balance to strike. Mm -hmm. And I do think also that I agree that in that, in, in if you look at it this way, uh, in that sense, I mean, default tier makes more sense than application tier, maybe, as a name. Sure, um, but if you want to have five pre-created tiers, then uh, maybe application tier <laughs> sounds better, I think. <laughs> By the way, um, if don't all of the resources have some type of a GUID tracking them anyway? So uh, we, we shouldn't be opposed necessarily if somebody renaming it, maybe the, the default tier, renaming it to another tier. Um, the problem is, I guess, with the binding, right? So we're binding by name for the policies. Right. Okay. Right. Got it. Yeah, it, it, it's like a typical cluster scope resource, you know, where the names are unique. And uh, updating the name is as good as creating uh, a new new resource. Okay, 
Understood. Got it. I mean, there is an alternative of like, you know, having those five tiers created as is uh, the CRDs, and then we create an additional default tier. So we have those application and defaults, but uh, that's too much complexity. And in my head, actually, when I said, when I think default tier, I kind of feel like the tier where the Kubernetes network policies go. So under all the uh, tiers we define for entry uh, specific policies. So maybe application is not that bad. Okay, so at least at least we have a consensus that uh, we move forward with recreating those tiers and then uh, at least, uh, and then maybe you know which ones are system owned with what are the names we can probably talk on the PR, on i mean we can call, have a conversation on the pr mm -hmm. sounds good yeah. okay that, that's all from here thanks everyone uh, Salvatore, there were two quick things I wanted to bring up before we uh, we stop the meeting. I mean, assuming no one else wants to bring up anything. Uh, I just wanted to ask if we intend to support uh, endpoint slices in Entria proxy. Uh, I think that's a question that uh, has come up. And I think in uh, starting with Kubernetes 1.19, uh, endpoint slices are enabled by default in, in the cluster and uh, uh, in Kube proxy. So did we intend to implement uh, endpoint slices support? We should, yes, I guess. We should keep up with the anything, any change that is uh, you know, in Kubernetes API, we should not have unsupported the features. Yeah, they so they, they are, uh, are they in beta or uh, GA status now? Uh, I don't remember if they were promoted to beta or if they were already GA. Well, because they went through several stages, right? What I know now is they're enabled by default with Q proxy, And before that, I think the API was enabled, but unless you... Mm -hmm. Explicitly enabled it in Q proxy. It was not That's like, right. uh, used. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we should support them anyway. Uh, but do we know that uh, was it? Is it part of the 1.15 or 14 release? Uh, because I think uh, one of the reasons why we are not moving towards new resources is that we also want to support uh, Kubernetes 1.15. Yeah, I, I don't know if that case is a bit different in the sense that we can have like a, a feature gate for endpoint slices or I don't know if we can try and detect if the, I guess we cannot try and detect. Oh, yeah, I guess we can try to detect if the API is uh, active. Uh, uh, I think you can, uh, basically my point is I think you can support those endpoint slices in an entry a proxy without breaking uh, support for older Kubernetes versions. Okay, so we do plan to uh, like have a flag or some, something like that to, to use a, either endpoint slice or the endpoints. Uh, I think, I don't think it's an easier. Uh, I think you should still monitor, uh, you, still, you should still watch both APIs, but I, I didn't, I didn't look into it too much. Um, So yeah, I opened an issue on GitHub about this. We can continue the conversation there. Uh, I don't know if uh, Wei Chen has thought about it already or, or not. Mm, yes, I think Wei Chen can look into the issue to see whether some blocking, breaking issues introduced. Thank you. And the second thing is more of a bookkeep, bookkeeping item. Uh, 
Salvatore, do you know if we sent like an actual calendar invite for the meeting on the mailing list that we need to update because of like the one week shift? Um, there, uh, mm, I don't think we have an invite on the calendar on the calendar. I don't think we have, but I will verify it. And if not, we'll add a new one with the uh, with the new calendar. Yeah, but I don't think we have it on the one on the. Uh, on the main uh, Kubernetes, you mean the main uh, Kubernetes meeting list, right? Uh, no, I meant like, um, I, I don't know if when you created the meeting, you actually added to the list of attendees, uh, the mailing list so that everyone got a notification. I actually don't remember because I know that sometimes we have like a couple more people attending and I, I'm wondering if... Uh, uh, the there, is surely, there is surely no reminder uh, sent uh, from Zoom automatically. Uh, for this, uh, the, the what, what I need to change is the let's say the Zoom meeting schedule, which is probably not relevant because uh, at the end of the day you can start the meeting whenever you want. But the meeting is scheduled, uh, uh, you know, for instance, for the, to be next Tuesday, and then that that should be changed. But in terms of uh, automatic notifications to attendees, we don't have anything because you know, being a community meeting, we don't have a, an attendee list. So there is no way to notify uh, single persons. And uh, I don't know honestly if there is a way to send a message to the mailing list. That's something that I can try, send a message to the scheme, uh, to the mailing list uh, uh, about uh, the meeting schedule. That's something that I can try if it works. But anyway, you're on our next meeting now is going to be on uh, February 14th, uh, sorry, February, <laughs> September 14th. <laughs> and uh, you, have, you have love on your mind, Salvatore. No, no, you know what it is, it's just like September. September is the month where school begins and it looks like January, pretty much. That's why, <laughs> it's okay, it's the, the year is starting right now. Anyway, so yes, the next meeting will be on September 14th and then we'll go with the usual schedule of having a, a meeting every other week, uh, starting with uh, September for September 14th. Um, yep, yeah, and that will be it. It will also play nicely with the holidays in China. Abhishek just pointed out that endpoint slides are not yet GA. They will be GA 1.20. And uh, I believe that it's important for us to support them uh, when they become GA. So let's say that uh, uh, it be maybe if it's not for entry at 0 10 or for entry at 0 11, they should be supported in my opinion. All righty. And uh, is there anything else for today's meeting? I will try and see if I can send the notifications about a uh, uh, meeting schedule to the um, developer, developer mailing list. Uh, I don't know if there is a way for setting up also integration with the Slack channel. I'll try and do that too. And uh, Right, anything else for today? Uh, and, uh, and, no, then, which means uh, that I perhaps can stop the recording now.